Hello and welcome to WNBS Live. Thank you for joining us this Wednesday night. You can join us every Wednesday night from 7 to 7.30 by the way of WNBSLive.com. This program is brought to you by the Tri-City School of Preaching, overseen by the elders of the Stony Creek Church of Christ. Please do not miss your local Wednesday night Bible study to view this program. This program is archived each week. This section of our class is on the book of Hebrews and now our class tonight. Well, it's so good to have you with us tonight, a part of our class. We thank our class for being here. It's so good to see all of you, and uh, we appreciate uh, the interest in the study of the Word of God. As Logan said, we're in the book of Hebrews. We're in chapter 12. We'll continue our study in that great book in just a moment. Before we do that, let us remind you that tomorrow at 2 o'clock, from 2 to 3, we'll have the Arise to Truth radio program. Now, we're not going to be able to take calls, but we will be live on the air from 2 to 3 p.m., so be sure to listen in on WZAP 690 on your dial, Bristol, Virginia. You say, well, I, I can't pick that up, Eddie. Well, you can go on the Internet to Arise to Truth, type in Listen Live, and you can listen to the program and be a part of it as well. Just Arise to Truth, and when you type that in, uh, RiceTruth.com and then go to Listen Live and you'll be able to listen to the program. You can call in most of the time and be a part of it, but unfortunately we've had some uh, phone trouble. We should be having that fixed within the next few days. Hopefully next week uh, by Thursday we'll be able to do our program and take our calls again. Also we're going to be involved in our uh, lectureship. We have a lectureship here at the school and we use our students, our graduates, and it will begin June the 5th, Sunday. There you see the uh, speakers and the topics. We're gonna to be doing the Kings this year. And then on the 6th, we will have uh, classes beginning at 9.30. And we'll have classes for the ladies, classes for the men, and we'll have a future preachers class. Monday, Wesley and I are gonna be teaching the young men on how to outline. And then on uh, Tuesday, Brother Michael Jordan will be teaching them on how to pitch a song. We have some pitch pipes and they'll learn to do that. That's very important. And then on Thursday, Brother Jeff Johnson will be teaching on waiting on the Lord's Supper and prayer and some pointers relative to that. And that'll be the classes that begin at 9.30 each day. And as you see there, we have a list of speakers and topics that will be involved in the lectureship this year. So please, if you have opportunity, come and be with us. Last week we were talking about chastisement, discipline, and the different ways in which we're disciplined. And we noticed three of them. The conscience is one of the things that will discipline us. We read Romans 2. Our own brethren are to encourage us and discipline, be a part of the discipline. And then the Word of God will also be a part of the discipline that is involved in our relationship to God. Now tonight we want to continue that. And the next thing we want to notice that is used in the Word of God as a means of discipline is that of our elders. Tim, if you would, and they probably have this on screen too, Hebrews 13, 17, and then Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 3, 6. And while I'm doing that, it's good to have Tim back with us. Tim's been a little bit under the weather, but he's back among the living now. <laughs> and uh, so, Tim, we're glad to have you back in our, our class and feeling better, and we appreciate it so much that you uh, are back and feeling better. It's good to be back. All right, Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 17. Obey them that have rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they must give an account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Then over in 2 Thessalonians chapter uh, 3 and verse number 6, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he <coughs> received of us. All right, so we see from this that one of the uh, disciplinary actions of the God of heaven is through the eldership. Wesley, you served many years as an elder in the Lord's Church. How much uh, time and effort do you think is involved in trying uh, for an eldership to restore 
those that are erring, or maybe even some that's slipping away. You see them slipping away and not quite doing the way they used to. A lot of part of the work of an elder is devoted to that, isn't it? That's right, Ed. We spend a lot of time trying to restore those who have become unfaithful. Dan Manuel will tell you, he and I wore out some of my cars chasing members of the church that would not be faithful. Go and try to encourage them to be faithful. And it seems like with some of them, no matter how many visits were made, you just couldn't get them back. That's why church discipline's important. Right. To show that we're going to love them enough if they won't come back to withdraw fellowship from them. This is saying, in essence, if you don't want to be with God's people, then you need to be marked, delivered unto Satan, so you'll know which side you're on. We don't want to encourage people that are living ungodly to continue to do that, because that's going to damn their soul. And so this is why a stand must be taken. Now, you can see the brilliance of God to put an eldership over the flock, so that when a member of the church becomes unfaithful, that they go looking for that member rather than just letting him or her fall to the wayside and nobody care. And then, before you practice church discipline, get the whole congregation involved and try to get them to go by and see them or call them, write them a letter, send them a card, or whatever. Now, church discipline always works because it takes the bad leaven and discards it, as it were, keeps it from infiltrating the whole congregation and leading the congregation astray. It tells the world we don't endorse sin. It tells the congregation we don't endorse sin. And it tells God we love you first and foremost, even above our own family members and members of the congregation. I like, uh, I like what you said there. It always works. Yeah. You know, it doesn't always get the person that has departed back. That's right. But it always works. In, uh, and, I, you know, you hear some people, they use different expressions maybe. Uh, but church discipline is not optional, is it? It's a command. That's yeah. right. You read it in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6. So Just it, like Mark 16, 16 is a command. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6 is a command. And it's sad that there are some congregations of the Lord's church that will overlook that command. They'll be held accountable on the day of judgment That's right. for overlooking that command. And uh, like Wesley says, it always works. It's an act of love. We're trying to restore a soul back to the fold of God. It's, right. it's an act of love. And sometimes people they put up a, a wall when they hear, well, you know, we're going to get ready to withdraw fellowship from someone. You don't love that person. Well, if we're going to do what God tells us to do here in the scriptures we love that soul it's not vindictive we're not out you know <laughs> i'm going to get old howard here no that's not the that's not the case at all it should always be with the attitude of love restoring the soul and if at a certain time period the person does not repent withdraw fellowship from them that's right and you know tim i think when people have the mindset this don't work that's when they get into trouble. But if if I am in my, say my estimation is I've watched church discipline uh, so many times, it never works or it doesn't work most of the time. It wouldn't matter. Yeah. God still commands us. And we put the verse up and there it is. Look, now we command you. Not we have a suggestion. We command you, brethren, and look it by the name of, that is by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so you might as well, if you're going to throw this command out, Throw baptism out, the Lord's Supper out, or any other command. What if I told you, Eddie, Mark 16, 16 don't work, Eddie. I'm going to try something totally different. I'm going to teach the doctrine of faith only mm -hmm. to try to get people in. You know, just what we call, or maybe just a rock and cheer religion trying to get people in. I can't do that. But that's what some brethren have done with 2 Thessalonians 3, 6. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, or five, verse 5, excuse me. Here at Corinth, this man had his father's wife. The Apostle Paul says, as recorded in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 5, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. May be saved, that's with the idea of 
this man repenting. As a matter of fact, in uh, the uh, second uh, Corinthian letter, uh, in the second Corinthians uh, chapter 2, beginning in verse number 6, sufficient to such a man as this punishment, which was inflicted of many, so that contrariwise you ought to rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such one should be swallowed up with uh, over much sorrow. Wherefore I beseech you that you would uh, confirm your love toward him. The man repented. Right. And yeah. that was what that was the goal of the discipline, trying to get the man to repent. Amen. And if he didn't repent, withdraw from him. You know, we got into this on radio here a while back. Wesley mentioned I think somebody else brought it up first that we ought to be forgiving. We ought to just forgive people. It don't matter whether they ask for it or whatever. And what said we can't do that. Because the Bible says if they repent, forgive them. Now that's like the fellow that they practiced the church <coughs> discipline on. If that was the mindset, just forgive him, they would have never withdrew from him. They would have never been the disciplinary action that took place. And so because they took the disciplinary action, the guy repented. And that was what we, that's what always you want to ha happen. But if you just forgive people and say, well, you don't have to repent, we just forgive you, and that's the big thing to do. That's then just they're what, just going to keep doing what they're doing because it makes no difference. Uh -huh. There's no action taken upon them. It's just like withdrawal. As Christians, we need to look at the definition because we claim we're withdrawn and we go on, you couldn't tell if they better have been withdrawn or not. <laughs> if we love God enough, we'll do what He says. He created us. He ought to know what works. And we don't really practice it most of the time in our own lives when we withdraw from our brethren. We, we treat them just like they're okay. We never try to help them in, you know, in a way that would make them feel guilty of what they've done. We just make them feel okay. I know one time uh, they were, I was asked the question, what would uh, you do if it was your own child, for example, that was withdrawn from? Would you not eat with them? What would you do? I said, well, I'm not sure. If one of my children were withdrawn from, they'd want to eat with me. Because when they come to my house, they're going to hear a sermon. You know, they're not going to be just throw my arm around you and we'll eat a meal or we'll go play ball and act as if nothing's wrong. Because then you're making a mockery out of church discipline. You, you seem like, Eddie, you're trying to, maybe trying to shame uh, maybe one of your children. Now watch this from 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. And if any man obey not, our word by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him, watch this, that he may be ashamed. If I'm out uh, stealing, and Howard rebukes me, and, and, and I keep on stealing, and then here the eldership at Stony Creek, they try to work with me after a certain period of time, you know what, I should be ashamed of myself for doing that. As a member of the body of Christ, I should be ashamed. The man in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 should have been ashamed of having his father's wife. It should be to, uh, to shame us. As a matter of fact, about that, he may be ashamed. Watch this. Yet count him not as an enemy. We're still, even after withdrawal from the person, we're still to work with him. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now, he's an erring brother. But, you know, bottom line is, you know, don't count him as an enemy. Love him. Still let him know we love you even though you're withdrawn from. We want you to come back. We want you to think about your soul. You need to repent. So it's a, it's an act of love. And it always works. That's right. Yeah, and I'm confident if the brethren would, when you see people like that out in public that we've withdrawn from, tell them, say, we're praying for you. We love you. Come back. Yeah. You know, and, and tell them that. And don't just walk by and say, hey, how are you doing? You doing okay today? Great. And we go on. We need to let them know that we care about them, but we also want them to feel ashamed for the way they're living. That's right. That's exactly right. Think about all the elderships, though, it's going to answer to God because they don't believe this verse. And they need to put it into practice. They're trying to restore souls when they do. Now, Dan Manuel and I was at a house one time talking to a lady. She was on up in years, in her 80s, I suppose. And she told me, she was a member of the church, how long she had been a member of the church? I forget now, but she said, I've never heard of church discipline. Well, it's in the Bible. That just told me she didn't study her Bible. I mean, can you imagine one who reads the New Testament to say, I've never heard of church discipline? As Roy Hearn used to say, I believe I'd find church discipline in every book of the Bible. 
And it's just about in every book of the Bible. Okay. Showing that God believes in discipline. It all started in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve disobeyed God, God exercised discipline. And Satan was there, and he was trying to mislead them. Well, God had already dealt with him and disobedient angels. God is a God of discipline. Our nation is in the shape it's in because parents no longer believe in discipline. Our government no longer believes in discipline. And we're suffering as a result of it. And we see the Lord's church, many congregations, no longer believe in discipline. And because of it, anything goes and somebody's going to answer for that. That's exactly right. And you know, Wesley, through the Old Testament, over and over we read statements like, and they caused my people Israel to sin. Right. And so when uh, we don't do what we ought to do as children of God, whether it's practicing church discipline or whatever, we're encouraging others to become sinners as well. We're in, and so they can become sinners as a result of following us. And in Hosea chapter 6, it depicts the priest standing at a city of refuge, flagging the people in, as it were, that were ungodly, to take care of the ungodly in a city of refuge, for which it was never designed for that. Well, some elderships will flag the ungodly into their congregations to house the ungodly. To give an illustration, here's an eldership that takes a good stand and this couple's married unscripturally. And the eldership's working with them and telling them that you're going to have to deal with that. And if you don't deal with it, we can't fellowship you and we're going to have to take a stand against you. What do they do? They go run into a congregation that will take them in. And they're there flagging them in. You know, come on in here. We'll take you. Here's a social drinker. He believes in drinking. Well, the eldership takes a good stand. Well, here's another eldership flagging him in. We'll take you here. We don't make that a test of fellowship. And on and on we go about every Bible subject. Right. Those people are going to answer to God because they're damning the souls of men. That's exactly right, Wesley, and it's serious stuff, too. Uh, any other comments or questions on this one before we pass on to uh, comparative living? So we have the idea of we're looking at chastisement from Hebrews 12. We read uh, last time how that uh, the Bible teaches that God chastens us. And we're looking at some of the ways in which he does that. And so next we notice comparative living. And the last one, of course, is the threat of hell or next to the last. But we have uh, comparative living. Lee, how about you looking at uh, Matthew 11, verse 23, and Matthew 12, 41. I think both of these uh, will be on the screen. Uh, now Capernaum, which are exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee would have been done in Sodom, it would have been... It would have remained until this day. It would have remained until this day. Okay, and then ne the next uh, passage. 12, 41. Mm -hmm. okay. Matthew 12, 41. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with the generation and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Wesley, that sounds a little bit like we can't afford to go to hell from America, doesn't it? That's right. Now you just think about it. The God we serve is so brilliant that he's able to project a group of people into this environment and know what they would have done if they would have been given the same opportunities. And he, he knows how to take me and project me into their environment. Mm -hmm. And he knows what I would have done. So when the Bible says, look, the people of Sodom would have remained unto this day if they'd heard what you heard. Mm -hmm. Or the people of Nineveh, look at what they did. They repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Then God is expecting us to live up to the teachings that we have received. And like you say, we can't afford to go to hell from anywhere, but especially from America. I mean, we got Bibles everywhere. I got all kinds of Bibles in my office, all kinds of Bibles in my car, my home, all my computers. 
I mean, all kinds of Bibles. When you and I were to Memphis School of Preaching, we were reading and studying church history, where a man went out and worked all day, Ed, got his harvest, and was on his way home, ran into a guy that had a Bible. And he told that fellow, I'll give you half of what I reap today if you'll let me read that Bible for an hour. Now, we're going to stand next to him come Judgment Day. Now, you think about people that have died to give you and me the Bible, and we don't have enough time to read it. I mean, we're so busy out here, we think, making a living and having fun, that we don't have time for the most important thing upon the face of the earth, and that is to know what God's will is. That's right. And to make sure that we're obeying it. When I held a meeting in the Carolinas a few years ago, two men came. One of them was blind and could not get around without help. And as I sat across the table from him, he was talking about how he felt so sorry for certain people in their conditions. And I thought, my, my. And then another fella came to services and came, I think every service, but maybe one, rode his wheelchair, didn't have any legs, rode his wheelchair like we'd ride a vehicle down the road to the church building. And I mentioned those men the last night of the meeting, and I said, people that have their legs, have their eyesight, have their health, and we got to stand beside those men one of these days at the day of judgment and give an account because I thought how they had put people to shame there even in that congregation and I thought of the little widow she didn't give much but she gave everything she had and therefore gave more than any of them she gave her living and these guys gave a whole lot more than what I gave to go over there and to do what I did because of the price they paid and so the same thing is true here and you have this comparative living that God brings about and he says Pernium's going to be brought down to hell but Sodom and Solid uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, had they had the opportunities you've had, they would have remained to this day. That says a lot right there, especially when Abraham was talking talking about, is there 50 righteous, 45, 40, you know, 30, 20, 10. He stopped at 10. But now, you know, you take a look at Capernaum. And thou Capernaum, which are exalted unto heaven, shalt thou be, uh, shalt be brought down to hell. That right there really says a lot mm -hmm. about uh, Capernaum, the United States, uh, you know, different different countries. You know, here we have the gospel of Christ right in right in our hands. And we got, like Wesley said, numerous Bibles upon Bibles right here in the United States. And you know what? It's hard to try to get even a denominational preacher to even study the Bible with you. Yeah. I mean, some of them I, I've, I've listened to some of them with Wesley. Come, you know, study the Bible with. No, oh, well, don't. It won't do us any good. You'll just believe what you'll believe, and I'll believe what I'll believe, and we'll go on, and we'll be uh, happy, disagree to disagree. It's not going to be like that. Bottom line is, we can know the truth, John eight and verse thirty-two, and the truth will make us free. You know, and, and but we got to study. We got to put in a little bit of time. There is truth found in the Scriptures, but we must study to show ourselves approved unto God, and rightly divide the Scriptures. And why would we be afraid to do that? Yeah. You know, that should be a blessing and an honor for us to be able to get to study. They're in a real dilemma. That's why they don't want to study with you. Because they, <laughs> they believe error and they know they can't find it in the Bible. So they're in a real, real dilemma. But even at that, they can always come out with truth and more knowledge anytime you study the Bible. Yes. And uh, they would gain from it anytime you open the Bible. I, I can't understand somebody that proclaims there's some led by the Holy Spirit and wouldn't study the Bible with you. You know, that's one of their problems, Howard. They think they are led by the Holy Spirit, so they don't have to study. Yeah. And they therefore, they don't know. They contradict what the Holy Spirit actually says. That's right. Scriptures. Yeah, if they're led by the Holy Spirit, they know the words of Jesus. And it don't take about five minutes to figure that out. They don't know the words of Not Jesus. Not only the words of Jesus, but all of the words oh, of Jesus. Love them. Yeah, that's exactly right. And it's sad. It's sad. Ed, uh, Capernaum was exalted unto heaven in that Jesus, when he did his work on earth made that his hometown as it were right, That's right. and uh, according to Matthew 9 1 he came unto his own city by way of ship that's Capernaum so it's been exalted unto heaven and here think about all the miracles he did and all the teaching he said you were exalted to heaven but you will be cast down to hell 
You've had too many opportunities. You know, studying Daniel, I've been reading the first three or four chapters over and over, and you see here where the Jews were taken, Nebuchadnezzar took the best. He wanted the wisest people that he could get out of that group of people. And four of them we read of in those first three or four chapters that actually were doing what God would have them to do. Yeah. And, and the king, I mean, over here's three men that survive a, a fiery furnace that he turned up seven times or ten times greater than what he would normally have it. And they walk around, come out, their clothes didn't even smell like fire or anything. And he sees that and he can't even believe you know how powerful this God really is. He says he does, but he really doesn't believe it because he turns and goes right back into other gods. But that shows that's scary as members of the church. We better be doing what God says that's or we'll exactly. find ourselves unfaithful. And Eddie, to show you how important truth is, uh, there in Matthew chapter 12, verse 41, the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation mm -hmm. and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. Behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Now, Bottom line is, truth is the most important thing. People right. don't understand that. Someone might say, what about love? I wouldn't know about love if I didn't have truth. Right. And, and it revealed. Jonah didn't have any love for Nineveh. He didn't have any compassion for Nineveh. He didn't have any mercy for Nineveh. He, he told them, you got truth. He told them truth. And I'm obligated, even if Howard was to come up to me and say supposedly, uh, uh, here I am a non-Christian, and, and even my, Howard might have the wrong attitude, might have not even compassion toward me. said, Tim, you're so stupid. You can't understand Mark 16, 16? And I go, well, Howard, what an attitude. You know what? I'm still under the obligation to obey Mark 16, 16. Now, Howard's got to get his attitude right, you know, and, and make sure that he's uh, loving and speak the truth and uh, love. Well, both of you can be lost. Yeah, both of us can be lost. Bottom line is, I'm still under obligation to truth. You know, when you find, I never really thought about was thinking about discipline, but like if, say, Logan become unfaithful, he's my son, I'm obligated to truth to do what's right to withdraw from him. Yeah. You know, the love will come when I do what God says to do, when I listen to his truth and do what it says. That's I never thought of it quite like that. No, you, you really don't love if you don't know the do for whomever, what the scriptures You won't know how to love if you don't that's exactly. if you don't study the truth yeah, and don't know the truth. days and Nineveh be overthrown. Yes, he right. had a he waited there, he waited for Nineveh to be destroyed. But they did. They they repented. The Bible says here in Matthew chapter twelve, verse forty one, they repented. Even though Jonah he has attitude was sorry. He had no love toward him. He had no compassion toward him. Bottom line is truth was was the most important thing here in order to get them to see the error of their way. That's exactly right. What about the class, the threat of hell? That's our next point. Kind of goes along with this uh, comparative living as well. I had a preacher ask me one time what I thought about uh, preaching on the subject of hell, and if, I, and if I thought that was a proper approach to motivate people to obey the gospel. And uh, I remember a preacher said one time, I'd rather scare someone into heaven than tranquilize them into hell. And uh, so it is a motivating thing. Someone says, well, what if I obeyed the gospel not because I love God so much, but because I was afraid of going to hell? Well, that again gets back to loving God, whether you know it or not, because God's the one that gave us his word that warns us about hell. Let's notice some of these uh, passages of scripture that we have here. Vicki, if you would turn to uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. And Hannah, I'll let you read, if you will, the 25th chapter of the book of Matthew, verse 14. And then Ryan Lee, if you'll read uh, Hebrews 10, 28 and 29. All right, there's the first one on the uh, screen for us. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. All right, and then uh, Matthew 25 and verse number 14, huh? For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his gods, his goods. Okay, and then Ryan, the last two verses, Hebrews 10. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be that thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Okay, and then, uh, you know, in Hebrews, Paul said, How shall we escape 
if we neglect so great salvation. Talking about those of us that are living under New Testament Christianity in Hebrews 2, 1 to 4. So I would, and I did answer the preacher that asked me that question in the affirmative. I think, think absolutely that hell is one of the things that God has used, not the only, but one of the things that God has used to motivate us to want to do the right thing. He had the Matthew verse, Matthew 25, 14, should have been 41. Okay. Matthew 25, 41. If they'll put that back on the screen. There it is. And then whoever had that verse to read, read that place. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. All right, very good. In society today, though, nobody believes in hell. No, but they, they sure do believe in heaven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They they're, they're all, all going, really everybody's heaven. going to heaven. It don't matter what they've done. It don't matter what they've been involved in. I mean, you never go to a funeral of anybody that's not in heaven. That's right. You know what, and Wesley, we've dealt with this in our classes before. We've even got preachers in the Church of Christ that are denying their actual place of hell these days. That's right. You know, uh, I hope to write a chapter for a book that Drew's doing on what hell implies about God. Well, number one, it implies that sin's a lot worse than we thought it is. That's exactly right. Now you think about that. If somebody would ask me, Wesley, if God gives a commandment and somebody violates it, don't you think that's pretty bad? Yeah, yeah. Well, how bad do you think it is? Well, they shouldn't do it. You know, and I never would have guessed it would have caused Christ to have died. To get rid of the sin, mm -hmm. and I never would have thought the punishment for it would be eternity in the devil's hell being punished. See, I wouldn't have thought that. Sin's a lot worse than we ever thought it would be. So yes, you're right. We got members of the church that don't believe there's a hell where people are going to be punished in all eternity. But the Bible says there is. Well, is that just? Who is the one that knows what true justice is? Yes, exactly right. That's God Almighty. And it's obviously just or he would not do it. Is it just for a man 99 years old that's lived a very ungodly life to become a child of God a day before he dies and he does it from his heart to be able to be with God in all eternity? Is that just? God says it is. Manasseh. Yeah. You know, Manasseh yeah. was a king that lived as ungodly as anybody you'll ever read about, but toward the end of his life, he got it together and did the right thing. Yeah. And we got we got to realize that hell says a lot about God, who he is. You think about for hell to exist, God's got to know everything that goes on all the time, everywhere, even the thoughts of men, and it don't even keep them busy. And even casting the angels into it. That's, yeah. he, that's Hebrews 4.13. Neither is there any creature that is manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. That's right. He sees it all. You can't run you know, away. Milton and Mike and I were talking today. We were looking and we seen these. the wise company makes these buckets of dried foods to put up for, you know, in this country, who in the world is putting up we, we've got it made, we, and I'm thinking my generation and younger generations, we don't think about putting anything up of dried foods. We've had electricity, we've had indoor plumbing. I mean, we've got it all. If something don't work, we're complaining. We think it's the end of the world because something don't work. Do you think about people in foreign countries, uh, uh, they're worried about just getting something to eat. That's right. And I mean, we got Bible after Bible and everything, like you mentioned while we go to study. If we don't study in this country, we don't have to blame nobody but ourselves. Yeah, can you I, imagine a guy willing to pay half of a day's work, and back then real hard, just to read the Bible a couple hours? That's right. And Eddie, if you bought one, you'd really pay, be paying for it, too. That's right. Eddie, over in uh, Luke chapter 16, verses uh, 19 through 31, uh, where we have the... Uh, true account of the rich man of Lazarus, Lazarus uh, in verse 23, beginning to verse 23 of Luke 16, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, this is speaking of the rich man, right. being in torments, and saith Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus 
that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Look at the torment he was going through. Yeah. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things. Likewise, Lazarus, evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from hence. Then he said, I pray thee, Father Abraham, that thou would ascend him to my father's house. So here, the rich man, he's making a plea here to uh, Abraham, send Lazarus to my father's house. Watch this, verse 28. For I have five brethren, that he may testify to them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. So here's a lost child of God, lifting up his eyes, being in torments. And he's a lost child of God because here he said his brothers had Moses and the prophets. Well, if his brothers had Moses and the prophets at one time, he had Moses and the prophets. Here he is lost in the devil's hell trying to get some things here, trying to warn his five brothers lest they come to that place. That's right. So from the other side, as our Lord opens up the curtain, he's trying to show that here's the rich man. He does not want his brothers to come to that place. And if I have relatives that are lost, they do not want me coming to that place. That's exactly right. Eddie, on the way to services, Kay and I were talking. And of course, we have a Bible study each night. One of her questions was, "Do you are we saying that people who are not members of the Church of Christ are lost? I said, no, we're not saying that. The Bible is. That's right. The Bible is saying that all responsible people who are not members of the church that Jesus Christ established are lost. Right. So we were talking about this coming to services tonight, and she looked at me and said, do you know how few that's going to be? I said, okay, that's what the Lord said. Few there be that find it. And I looked at her and I said, Kay, do you believe that? She said, it's the only thing that makes sense. That there's just one church, one way, nothing else makes sense in religion. That's exactly right. And that's exactly right. I mean, like I'm saying in the day I know, there's two boats. you got to get on one of them. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. And there's only one boat. You better be on it. Hey, the rich man had his opportunity and he blew it. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Let's, uh, we don't have much time, but let's introduce the parent thing. How many times have we heard the church is losing their young people? The church is losing their young people. Well, ladies and gentlemen, into our class, discipline's got to start in the home. That's it. If it doesn't start in the home, we got trouble. It's got to start in the home. Proverbs 22, verse 6, also Ephesians 6, 1 to 4, places an emphasis upon the parents. Train up a child. The way he should go when he is old, he will not depart from it. See, that's the obligation that we have. In Ephesians 6, the Apostle Paul encourages people to do the right thing and to have discipline in the home. Children, obey your parents and the Lord. This is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee and that thou mayest live long upon the earth. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It's got to start, fellas, in the home, or else we're not going to ever build the relationship in uh, discipline that we need to. Eddie, if I don't teach my children to obey me and my wife, they'll not obey the teacher. They'll not obey police officers, the laws of the land, and they won't obey God. Wesley, when uh, people today get in trouble at school, they go home and tell their parents and they want to go whip the teacher. Yeah. What happened to me and you when we got in trouble at school? Oh, I wasn't worried about the teacher. <laughs> I was worried about mom and dad. That's like when I got a ticket one night for reckless driving. I wasn't worried about that ticket. I was worried about going home and telling dad that I got a ticket. I mean, because it was going to be judgment day when I told him. Shock of shocks to the younger ones in here, but 
when we got a whipping at school, we didn't go home and tell it because if we did, we'd get one at home too. Yeah. That wasn't a shock to me. <laughs> <laughs> My daddy always told me if I got whipped at school, baby, you better be ready for one when I get home. And that's right. I got a couple of weeks, I think. <laughs> so it makes it least. Well, uh, we'll talk about this last one next week and, and get uh, in back into the text of Hebrews. But we do appreciate you joining us tonight on our program. Class, thank you for being here and being a part. If you're not a member of the Church of Christ, we want to encourage you to obey the gospel of Christ and have your sins remitted. You do that by hearing the gospel. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It comes through the belief that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, John chapter 8, verse uh, 24. Through the repentance of our sins, Acts 17, 30, God commands all men everywhere to repent. We must confess the Christ before men, Matthew 10, 32 and 33 or be denied before the Father in heaven. And then, as we've mentioned in our class tonight, Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Now, once this act has been done, the Lord adds us. We don't join. We're not voted into it. The Lord adds us to his church. Those that were being saved were being added to the church, Acts 2, 47. Well, one that obeys the gospel does that. He must be faithful got to continue in God's holy and divine will. Revelation 2.10, Hebrews 6.11, 1 Corinthians 15.58. Now if he doesn't remain faithful, he needs to repent and pray God. Acts 8.22, if perhaps the thought of his heart might be forgiven him. Now that's what the Bible says. Some things are right, some things are wrong, but the Bible is always right. Thank you for being a part of our class tonight. God bless you till we have the opportunity to study again.